Hello YouTube. So as promised in the previous video, today we're going to be talking about Metaphor. Um, that video uh, didn't work, by the way, just in case anyone was interested. Didn't get any responses with that, so um, I guess it was a bit of a long shot really. But uh, anyway, um, back to the philosophy today. Uh, so we're going to look at some different theories of metaphor, uh, which I think is one of the more intriguing areas of philosophy of language. Philosophers traditionally have focused mostly on literal language, which is understandable because that's what seems to matter most for, for, for most purposes in philosophy. But our actual speech is saturated with metaphor. Uh, arguably almost every sentence used in an everyday context contains some metaphorical aspects. So, you know, if we're interested in how language works, how it shapes our concepts of the world, then we need to consider metaphor. So our primary question is, how do metaphors work? What is metaphorical meaning? How do people grasp metaphorical meaning? Now, in this video, we're going to examine three approaches to metaphor that are popular in traditional philosophy of language. I want to note at the outset that more recently, new accounts of metaphor have been developed mainly through the work of, in, in cognitive linguistics, um, the work of Lakoff and Johnson on what they call conceptual metaphor is uh, particularly prominent here. And we'll examine that in the next video, um, but not today. Uh, so in particular, in this video, we're going to assume that metaphor is a particular type of linguistic expression, a figure of speech in which one thing is represented as something else. Now, not all accounts of metaphor treat it as a primarily linguistic phenomenon, uh, but we'll assume the traditional view for now, that metaphor is a, a figure of speech where you know, words and concepts that are normally applied in connection with one subject are used for talking about another subject. So Juliet is the sun. Uh, a woman is spoken of as if she were a celestial body, a whirlpool of lies. Deception is spoken of as if it were a vortex of water. Um, now, the traditional assumption is that metaphor has two faces. It involves two types of meaning. There is the literal meaning, which is usually plainly false, and then the metaphor somehow also expresses another meaning, a metaphorical meaning, which may be true. So there's the proposition literally expressed and the proposition or propositions metaphorically or figuratively expressed. Uh, take the metaphor, Juliet is the sun. Well, read literally, this claims that Juliet is uh, the star at the center of our solar system, but it figuratively expresses that Juliet is uh, an object of importance, a source of comfort, um, you know, some, somebody that the speaker loves and so on. So we have two meanings associated with the metaphorical sentence. And the question is, well, how does this work? What is the metaphorical meaning? Now, perhaps the simplest account of metaphor is the simile theory. Notice that metaphor involves a kind of comparison of one thing with another. Juliet is the sun, in some, in some sense, compares Juliet with the sun. Now, this is a feature that metaphor shares with simile. In simile, the comparison is made explicit, uh, and this has prompted the thought that metaphor is simply an abbreviated simile. So what is figuratively expressed by Juliet is the sun is the simile Juliet is like the sun, or you know, Juliet resembles the sun, or some equivalent claim. In general, then, A is B just means A is like B. The truth of the metaphor is then just a matter of the truth of the simile. There's nothing puzzling about similes, about stating resemblances between things. Similes can be understood literally, so the metaphorical meaning uh, is straightforwardly explained. Um, and, and this, of course, easily accounts for the two faces of metaphor. On the one hand, Juliet is the sun is plainly false when read literally, but on the other, the simile, uh, Juliet is like the sun, um, can be taken to be true. Now, while this view might initially seem plausible, it does face problems. First, um, one of the big problems with this view is that similarity is uh, vacuous in that any two things are both similar and dissimilar in countless ways. In what way exactly is Juliet like the sun? Well, she's not like the sun in being a gigantic ball of gas that is undergoing nuclear fusion. Uh, of course, context helps us to specify the respects of similarity that are relevant. If Romeo says, Juliet is like the sun, we know he isn't claiming that she's a gigantic ball of gas because we know that he knows that she's a person. We know that she's the object of his affections and so on. So Juliet is like the sun 
in being an object of importance, in being a source of comfort, uh, and so on. So the question then is, well, does this list of relevant similarities, this list, Julia is an object of importance, Juliet is a source of comfort, does that list give the literal meaning of the simile? When I say Juliet is like the sun, does that literally mean that she is an object of importance, that she is a source of comfort? Well, no. Taken literally, the simile declares no more than that there is a similarity between Juliet and the sun. The simile doesn't literally tell us which specific similarities are relevant. That's something that we have to work out beyond the literal meanings of the terms. Now we might say that the list of relevant similarities, Juliet is an object of importance, Juliet is a source of comfort, and so on, we might say that that list gives the figurative meaning of the simile. Well, fair enough. But then saying that metaphor is abbreviated simile doesn't really help us to understand metaphor. All we learn is that both metaphor and simile work by having some kind of figurative meaning beyond their literal meaning. But our initial question was, well, you know, what is this figurative meaning or this metaphorical meaning? I mean, arguably, metaphors and similes raise basically the same puzzles. Metaphors are almost always false and, I mean, like, obviously false. Uh, the question is how these obviously false statements can be used to express interesting claims. Simile, on the other hand, is always true and trivially true because for any two objects, you're going to be able to find some way in which one is like the other. So A is like B is, is just trivially true. Uh, again, the question arises, how is it that a trivially true statement can be used to express uh, interesting and substantive claims? In fact, there are actually, other, uh, there, there are actually metaphors that are, that are true, um, uh, like no man is an island. That's a metaphor, but taken literally, it's obviously true. So I think maybe what, you know, what's puzzling about metaphor isn't so much that metaphors are false taken literally, but just that metaphors seem to have this second layer of meaning beyond the literal. And that is also the case for simile. Uh, similes, we can treat similes as just being true, but um, the truth of a simile doesn't really tell us much. It's trivial. Now, there have been attempts to defend the simile view um, by giving an account of figurative meaning that would explain the meaning of, of simile. The more sophisticated form of the simile view is called uh, figurative simile theory in um, Lycan's introduction to philosophy of language. So how exactly does figurative simile theory work? Uh, Robert Fogelin in his book Figuratively Speaking explains this by appealing to the notion of salient features. The salient features of an object are those features that tend to strike you most forcefully. The, the, those features that tend to draw your attention, those that distinguish the object from other objects of the same type. Now, Fogelin says, under normal circumstances, when we compare A to B, when we say A is like B, it is the salient features of B that form the standard of comparison. We take the phrase A is like B to be true just in case A shares B's salient features. So Fogelin is claiming that similarity is asymmetric, um, you know, it's, it's sometimes thought that, well, if A is similar to B, then B must be similar to A. But this isn't really how similarity judgments work in practice. Studies have shown that such judgments are asymmetric, uh, in particular the work of Amos Tversky, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, Amos Tversky, T-V-E-R-S-K-Y, um, on, on similarity judgments. Uh, for example, in a study from the 1980s, people rated North Korea to be more similar to China than China was to North Korea. People more strongly endorsed the claim that North Korea is similar to China than the claim that China is similar to North Korea. Along the same lines, Lycan uh, suggests that chipmunks are more similar to rats than rats are to chipmunks. Um, although I have to say I'm not sure I share his intuition on that one. I, uh, I, don't, know, I don't know about that. But uh, the point is people do seem to uh, make asymmetric similarity judgments. And the reason why this happens, um, according to Fogelin at least, is because when we evaluate the statement A is like B, we judge it on the basis of the salient features of B, not A. And it may be the case that A shares B's salient features while B does not share A's salient features. So when we, we endorse North Korea is like China, 
Maybe because the salient feature of China is that it's a communist dictatorship, and that's a feature shared by North Korea. We don't endorse China is like North Korea, perhaps because the salient feature of North Korea is that it is a small country, something that China doesn't share. I'm not sure, is North Korea small? I don't, I don't know. I'm not good with the, I, I, I'm not entirely sure about the geography there. I think they have quite a large population actually, but, um, but the, you know, the, the specific reasons, uh, the specific details here don't matter, right? The, the point is just that um, North Korea shares China's salient features, but China doesn't share North Korea's salient features, at least according to Fogelin. Uh, now, if Fogelin is uh, right about all this, then we immediately diffuse the problems for the simile view. Similes are not trivially true. In context, we judge A is like B by asking whether A shares the salient features of B, which it may not do. Now, in a certain class of similes, what Fogelin calls figurative similes, the standard of salience, in a sense, reverses. So when A is like B, when that's a figurative simile, rather than looking for the salient features of B, we look for the salient features of A. Take the simile, Churchill was like a bulldog. Well, what are the salient features of bulldogs? They are canine, four-legged, covered with fur, they bark, they have wet noses, and so on. Clearly, Churchill shares none of the salient features of bulldogs, so we can't take that simile literally. Instead, when we consider this simile, we, um, in Fogelin, as, as Fogelin puts it, we trim the feature space of bulldogs in terms of Churchill's salient features. In other words, we search for features of bulldogs that match the salient features of Churchill. Some of the salient features of Churchill are perhaps toughness, stubbornness, certain physical characteristics like a jowly face and a thick neck. And so it's figuratively true that Churchill was like a bulldog because these features are shared with bulldogs. Another example, um, money is like blood. What are the salient features of blood? It's a red liquid, it's contained inside bodies, it's pumped by the heart and so on. So money obviously doesn't share the salient features of blood, but let's trim the feature space of blood in terms of the salient features of money. Some of these salient features are that money circulates around systems and facilitates vital exchanges, that if not enough money is present, the systems will break down, and those are shared with blood. The simile leads us to notice that money plays a similar role in society as the blood does in the body. So it's figuratively true that money is like blood. Um, Unfortunately, even this more sophisticated statement of the simile theory can't deal with all of the problems that the simile theory faces. For one thing, Fogelin's theory still assumes that when we state a metaphor or a simile, we search for similarities in the sense of properties that are shared between two domains. But when we try to state exactly what properties are shared, it turns out that properties are shared only in a metaphorical sense. Uh, here's an example from Lycan's intro. Uh, take the metaphor, Sally is a block of ice. Now, according to figurative simile uh, theory, we're saying that Sally is like a block of ice, and she's the like a block of ice in that the block of ice shares Sally's salient features. So what might these salient features be? It is very hard to say what property is literally shared by frozen water and a person's temperament. What we want to say is that Sally's personality is hard and cold, but the claim that Sally's personality is hard and cold is itself metaphorical. Obviously, we're not claiming that her personality has a low temperature. Perhaps we'd say that Sally is unemotional, unresponsive, unyielding. But then speaking literally, blocks of ice are no more unemotional, unresponsive, unyielding than tables or bonfires or the sky or any other inanimate entity. But surely... You know, Sally is a table and Sally is the sky would mean something completely different to Sally is a block of ice. A final problem is simply that some metaphors can't easily be translated into simile form. Metaphor is often much more sophisticated than A is B. Even fairly simple metaphors are, are often more sophisticated than this. Suppose that Ted is a prankster and Delia is one of his victims. Somebody describing the prank might say, Ted stalked Delia for two miles before pouncing on his prey. This doesn't have the simple form A is B. Now we might translate it, um, I don't know, Ted stalked Delia for two miles before doing something like a predator pouncing on its prey. But does that capture the meaning of the metaphor? 
I mean, the metaphor encourages us to view Ted as a predator, Ted in general, not just specifically his pouncing on Delia. So maybe it should be translated, Ted, who was like a predator, stalked Delia for two miles before doing something like pouncing on his prey. Um, does that capture the meaning? It's kind of hard to say. When we consider more poetic literary metaphors, this problem worsens significantly. Uh, Lycan gives the example of the, uh, the, the Shakespearean metaphor, when the blood burns, how prodigal the soul lends the tongue vowels. Uh, just try translating that into a simile. Lycan's own stab at a translation of this is, when X, which is like a person's blood, does something that resembles burning, how prodigally Y, which is like a person's soul, does something similar to lending some things that are vow-like to Z, which resembles a person's tongue. Um, I'm not sure if we can make much sense of that particular simile. Uh, so, uh, so, so one of the big problems with, with simile theory, it's just not clear what exactly the similes are that a metaphor is supposed to be paraphrasing. Okay then, let's turn to a different approach. A popular approach to metaphor appeals to Gricean theories of communication. Grice developed a whole theory of language, not just metaphor, but uh, his theory applies to metaphor in a particularly illuminating way, so we'll briefly explain the overall idea of Grice's programme. First, Grice draws a distinction between sentence meaning and speaker meaning. Now, the precise details are not so important here, but speaker meaning is basically a matter of psychology. It's a matter of what a particular individual in a particular context intends to communicate when she makes an utterance. Sentence meaning is the literal meaning of the utterance. So Grice draws a distinction between what the sentence literally means and what it is used to communicate. When we use a sentence to communicate something beyond its literal meaning, this is conversational implicature. And implicature is a very, very common feature of our discourse. For example, let's say we're having a heated argument and I shout, there's the door. The literal meaning, the sentence meaning, this is just, this is just a description of the location of the door. But obviously, the speaker meaning is a command along the lines of get out or leave the room. Or suppose Frank asks me whether I'm going to the party tonight and I respond, I have to work. Taken literally, this doesn't answer Frank's question. The sentence I actually uttered doesn't say anything about parties, but clearly I'm using this sentence to implicate that I'm not going to the party. Final example, John ate some of the cookies. This implicates that John did not eat all of the cookies. Notice that even if John did eat all of the cookies, and even if I know he did this, what I said is still true. But it would be misleading to say, you know, John ate some of the cookies if I know that he ate all of them, right? If I knew he ate all the cookies and I said John ate some of the cookies, that would be misleading because, because that statement implicates that he didn't eat all of the cookies. Now, you should already have a general idea of how this applies to metaphor. In metaphor, words and phrases have their standard literal meanings, but the person who utters a metaphor can be taken to implicate something different from the literal meanings. Metaphor is just one special case of where uh, speaker meaning diverges from sentence meaning. So, how exactly do implicatures arise? Well, according to Grice, implicatures are generated because all participants to a conversation observe what he calls the cooperative principle. Here's how Grice states the cooperative principle. Make your contribution such as is required at the stage at which it occurs by the accepted purpose or direction of the talk exchange in which you are engaged. Uh, basically, we assume that each participant in a conversation will say what is appropriate given the context. Now, this general principle is probably a little bit confusing and certainly vague, but it summarises a number of conversational maxims which fall into four broad categories. First of all, there is the maxim of quantity. This, sa this says that your contribution to a conversation must be informative but not too informative. It must be as informative as required. You, you, you give as much information as is required, but no more than that. So there's kind of, this sort of breaks down into two more specific maxims. Be informative, don't be too informative. Uh, second, the maxim of quality. This states that you should not say things uh, that you believe to be false, and you should not say things for which you lack adequate evidence. When a person makes a statement about the world, we assume that they are expressing what they believe and what they take themselves to have 
good reason to believe. Now, of course, this doesn't mean that they actually do have good reason for their belief. Let's say that Frank forms his beliefs on the basis of consulting a crystal ball. Well, I would regard that as a highly unreliable way to form beliefs, so in general I would think that many of Frank's beliefs are not well supported. But when he makes statements about the world, I can assume that he takes himself to have good reasons for his beliefs. Uh, so, you know, I, 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 yes, the crystal ball is not a reliable basis, but Frank takes it to be a reliable basis, and that's the point. He takes himself to have a reliable basis for his beliefs. Third, the maxim of relation. This just says your utterance should be relevant to the conversation. Finally, the maxim of manner. This tells you to avoid ambiguity, to be brief, to express yourself in a clear and straightforward way. So this is a matter of the style of your speech. Anyway, we assume that participants in a conversation are observing these maxims. We assume that participants are being cooperative. And on the basis of this assumption, we can draw inferences from their utterances. And this is how implicatures are generated. Now, it's important to note here that when Grice describes participants as being cooperative, he's talking specifically about a kind of linguistic cooperation, the cooperation that is required to sustain communication between people. We might not be cooperating in any other sense. We might be deadly enemies, each out to harm the other, but we might still need to be able to talk to each other. For that, we need to speak the same language and observe certain maxims. Uh, notice, for example, that a threat can be implicated. One person says to another after an argument, I know where you live. It's clearly a threat, but you know it's, it's communicated because both parties are observing the cooperative principle, they're observing these maxims, so they can draw inferences beyond the literal meanings of the terms. Taken literally, I know where you live is just a statement about your knowledge, it's not a threat, right? But you implicate a threat. So when Grice calls this the cooperative principle, he doesn't mean to imply that people are, you know, all being friendly and working together. It's a kind of linguistic cooperation. Right, well, that's the general idea. How exactly uh, does, does this work? Let's take the example of, I know where you live. Let's say we're talking on the phone. I've loaned you a significant amount of money and now I want it back. You're refusing to pay me. Our discussion gets heated and I say, I know where you live. While interpreted literally, this would clearly violate the maxim of relation. What does it matter if I know your address? So you search for some other meaning. In this case, I'm implying that I could come to where you live and do harm to you. Or take one of our earlier examples. John ate some of the cookies. If I knew that John ate all of the cookies, I would be in a position to say something more informative uh, at no cost to the simplicity of my utterance, namely the statement, John ate all of the cookies. So by the maxim of um, quantity, you assume that I'm being as informative as I can. So when I say that John ate some of the cookies, this implicates that he didn't eat all of them. Another example, Martha produced some sounds that closely corresponded to the tune of Werewolves of London. This implies, uh, implicates that Martha is a bad singer. Why? Well, taken literally, it's obviously in violation of the maxim of manner, which tells us to be brief, to uh, express ourselves succinctly. We could just say, Martha sang Werewolves of London. So why not say the briefest statement? Because the speaker wants to draw attention to the difference between what Martha did and the kind of performances to which the term singing is normally applied. Uh, so Martha's a bad singer. In general, then, if an utterance would violate one of these maxims when interpreted literally, uh, we are probably dealing with conversational implicature. We interpret people's utterances to, um, in such a way as to bring them in line with the maxims. And this means we often interpret the speaker as intending to communicate something beyond the literal meaning of the sentence. The speaker violates a maxim at the level of what is literally said, but not at the level of what the... Uh, speaker meaning it is, and not at the level of what the speaker expresses. It should be fairly obvious how this applies to metaphor. Metaphors usually flout the maxim of quality because metaphors interpreted literally are obviously false, and we know that they would obviously be false to the speaker as well. Grice gives the example of, you are the cream in my coffee. Everybody knows that no person could literally be cream in coffee, so we have a blatant violation of the maxim to speak truthfully. What's more, um, in context, like in a in the context of a, of a romantic dinner where my girlfriend has just said that she loves me, in that context, the statement, you are the cream in my coffee, is totally irrelevant, violating the maxim of relation. 
So I must be implicating some other proposition. Uh, the proposition that I love my listener, that my listener is important to me, that my listener is comforting to me, uh, or whatever. Now, the obvious benefit of the Gricean account is that it explains metaphor by appealing to an independently developed theory of language, a theory that has been highly influential and that has all kinds of other applications. In this respect, Grice's view is uh, theoretically simple. Um, you know, we, we work out what a speaker intends to communicate the same way we do with every other type of speech on the basis of the literal meaning of the utterance plus these general principles of interpretation, these maxims. And, and so there's, there's no need to appeal to any kind of metaphorical meaning beyond that. That, that, the, um, that kind of theoretical construction already applies to some parts of speech. We can just apply it to metaphor as well. And it, it does seem like Grice is, is on to something here. Um, you know, with examples like, you know, John ate some of the cookies and I know where you live, at least. Uh, so we just apply the same theory to metaphor. Another benefit is that Grice can deal fairly easily with complex metaphors. Uh, unlike in simile theory, what is implicated by a speaker does not need to have a form that is translatable from what is literally said. Compare there's the door, which is a descriptive proposition, with what it implicates, the order to get out. Working out what is implicated by there's the door doesn't involve that sort of translation. Um, so there's no need to force all metaphors into a simile form, into the form A is like B. Juliet is the sun might implicate I love Juliet rather than Juliet is like the sun. Finally, uh, Grice provides quite a neat account of dead metaphor. Uh, this is explained by Margaret Reimer in her article, The Problem of Dead Metaphor. A dead metaphor is, is a phrase that was originally a metaphor, but now literally means what it used to mean metaphorically. It no longer evokes the metaphorical imagery. Time is running out was originally a metaphor which referenced the hourglass where sand literally runs out of the top part of the hourglass. Mouth of a river originally referred literally to the anatomical mouth. Um, you know, obviously these days we use river's mouth to refer just to the end of the river. Uh, deadline, as in essay deadline, originally referred uh, literally to the line around the perimeter of a prison where a prisoner would be shot if they crossed it. Obviously, today, essay deadline just means uh, that's when you've got to hand the essay in. Recall the distinction between speaker meaning and sentence meaning. Well, part of Grice's overall project uh, is that he attempts to reduce sentence meaning to speaker meaning, to show how sentence meaning is constructed out of speaker meaning. And essentially what Grice says is that the sentence meaning of a particular expression is just a matter of how that expression is normally or conventionally used by speakers. Uh, more precisely, we should, we, we should say, expression E has literal meaning M for linguistic community C, just in case E is regularly used in C to communicate M. The sentence meaning or literal meaning of a particular type of utterance is determined by whatever the standard speaker meaning of tokens of that utterance are. Now, I, I should note that as stated, this is actually too simple. It does need to be tweaked to uh, avoid obvious counterexamples. Um, but the general idea, I suppose, is, is fairly intuitive. Um, and, uh, you know, well, I mean, we, 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 this isn't really a video specifically about Grice, so we won't go into all of the the technical details, but you know the general idea, as I say, seems intuitive enough. So take a dead metaphor like time is running out. Well, originally this prompted the image of the sand of an hourglass literally running out of the top of the hourglass. We would be invited to compare time as an abstract concept to the action of the hourglass. The sentence meaning uh, was about the hourglass. The speaker meaning was that there was little time left. The metaphor became popular and eventually it took on a new literal meaning the literal meaning that there is little time left. So now the phrase no longer prompts any of the metaphorical imagery. What was once the speaker meaning has now become the new sentence meaning because that's how the sentence uh, was regularly used and is still regularly used. A popular metaphor is a dead metaphor. So Grice has a, a neat explanation for why some metaphors lose their metaphorical force. Um, once once the metaphor becomes regularly used, you know, once a metaphor like time is running out becomes regularly used to communicate that time, you know, there's little time left, then that becomes the literal meaning of the sentence and it's no longer a metaphor or it's a dead metaphor.
Despite these benefits, there are some difficulties for Grice's view. One of the most troubling problems for Grice's overall project, not just his account of metaphor, but his whole theory of conversational implicature, is that there seems to be a significant gap in his theory. His theory essentially postulates two stages to communication. In the first stage, we detect a difference between sentence meaning and speaker meaning. And on this point, his analysis seems pretty powerful. The claim that we you know, realise that a person is communicating something beyond the literal meaning of their sentence by assuming that all speakers are following the four maxims, that makes a lot of sense. But then there's the second stage, where we have to reconstruct what the speaker meaning actually is. What is the speaker trying to communicate? And the trouble is that the maxims don't really give us much to go on here. Take the example of, you are the cream in my coffee. Well, obviously this is being used non-literally, otherwise it would violate the maxim of quality. Fair enough. But how do we work out that it expresses a proposition along the lines of, I love you? It's not obvious how the maxims help. Maybe we can apply the maxim of relation here. In the context of a romantic dinner, where one person has said they love the other, we would expect the other to respond with something in kind. So, you know, that kind of context gives us enough to work out uh, by the maxim of, of relation and the other maxims that the person is saying, I love you. Maybe that works. But then with more sophisticated metaphors, it's uh, even more difficult. Recall the Shakespearean metaphor um, that we saw earlier, you know, when, when the blood burns, how prodigal the soul lends the tongue vows, or whatever. Uh, uh, it's um, hard to see how exactly to apply these maxims to work out what the meaning actually is. Another problem for Grice concerns what are sometimes called twice apt metaphors. Um, so here's another Shakespearean example. Romeo says, here's to my love, he drinks, O oh, true apothecary, the drugs are quick, thus with a kiss I die. In this passage, the uh, true apothecary refers literally to the pharmacist who sold the poison to Romeo, and also metaphorically to death itself. How does Grice's theory account for this? I mean, interpreted literally, the utterance is already in line with conversational maxims, so we don't detect any divergence between sentence meaning and speaker meaning, yet we still attribute metaphorical meaning to the speaker. We take the statement to be acceptable both in terms of its literal meaning and in terms of its metaphorical meaning. And more generally, with some metaphors, even if you don't interpret them literally, they would not flout the maxims even if you were to do so. If somebody says, Anchorage is a cold city, that might be said as a metaphor, though it's perfectly true when spoken literally, and it may even be relevant to the conversation in its literal sense. Uh, if I'm asking whether I should move to Anchorage, the fact that temperatures in Anchorage tend to be low might be perfectly relevant information to me. Nevertheless, Anchorage is a cold city can still be used to express that uh, Anchorage is a, um, you know, an, an, an unemotional, unwelcoming sort of place. A final problem for the Gricean. According to Grice, metaphorical meaning is simply a matter of speaker meaning. It's a matter of what the speaker intends to communicate. One worry about this is that metaphors often have meanings beyond what the speaker intends or even anticipates, uh, especially when we consider the more sophisticated poetic metaphors. When we consider any kind of literature, much of the work is done by the audience. We have to interpret literature um, and, and few people would say that the meaning of a piece of literature is simply a matter of the author's intentions. Uh, the meaning of a literature goes beyond what the author intends. And if this is right, metaphorical meaning can't just be a matter of speaker meaning. Uh, and this point inspires the final theory that we will examine, the causal theory. So, the causal theory. This was most famously defended by Donald Davidson in his article, What Metaphors Mean. According to Davidson, there is no such thing as metaphorical meaning. Sentences have only literal meanings. So Juliet is the sun just means that Juliet is the sun, that she is the celestial body that resides at the centre of our solar system. To quote Davidson, metaphors mean what the words in their most literal interpretation mean and nothing more. So like Grice's account, on the causal theory, metaphors, you know, they, 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 they don't, the, the sentence, the metaphorical sentence has no special meaning, it has only literal meaning. But whereas the Gricean says that metaphor can be used to communicate or express some proposition that differs from the literal proposition, on the causal theory, there is no particular proposition that a speaker intends to communicate when somebody says a metaphor. Um, again, so to, to quote Davidson here, just so we're clear on what's being said, a metaphor has, I quote, 
no cognitive content that its author wishes to convey and that the interpreter must grasp if he is to get the message. So the causal theory is sometimes called a uh, non-cognitivist account of metaphor. Metaphors do not express metaphorical propositions. Okay, well if metaphors have no metaphorical meanings, how do they work? Well, the idea is that a metaphor simply makes us attend to some likeness between two things. Metaphors produce um, a kind of framing effect where we view one subject in a new light, afforded by juxtaposing it with, with another subject. When somebody says Juliet is the sun, we are prompted to view Juliet as the sun, and this allows us to notice particular things about Juliet. Or man is a wolf prompts us to view man as a wolf, to project wolfhood onto manhood. And this allows us to notice various things about mankind. Uh, but the important point is that metaphors operate in a purely causal way. They prompt us to notice things in a way that's analogous to being prompted to notice something after receiving a bump on the head. We can employ a metaphor to produce particular effects in our audience, just as we might employ a bump on the head to produce particular effects. But of course we shouldn't conclude that the bump or the metaphor means whatever those effects are, either in the sense of sentence meaning or speaker meaning. Um, incidentally, I should say that if, if you're worried that I'm straw manning Davidson with this analogy of a bump on the head, uh, that's the analogy that he himself gives. So, um, <laughs> you know, so yes, he's suggesting that metaphors simply cause us to notice things, just as a bump on the head might cause you to notice things. Uh, maybe actually a better way to put this is, in term, is, is that metaphors involve seeing as, not seeing that. Recall the famous duck-rabbit picture. This is an example that Davidson appeals to. I tell you that it can be seen as a duck or seen as a rabbit, and hopefully you're able to see it in both ways. But this seeing as isn't a matter of grasping some proposition. You could understand intellectually that the drawing can be seen either as a duck or as a rabbit without actually being able to see it in both ways. Right, so, so when, you, when you're prompted to see it as a duck or see it as a rabbit, um, that's, that's not a matter of, of you knowing that it can be seen as a duck or that it can be seen as a rabbit, because you can know that without actually being able to see it those ways. Similarly then, to grasp a metaphor like man is a wolf, right, that involves seeing as. To grasp the metaphor man is a wolf is to see man as a wolf. And that's not a matter of understanding some proposition expressed by the speaker. A metaphor is a literal statement that prompts us to see one thing as another. Now, if you are able to see man as a wolf, then you will be able to make comparisons, to notice similarities and dissimilarities, to use the concept of wolf to shed light on the concept of man. And some of what you notice might be expressible in propositional form, but such propositions are not contained in the metaphor itself, in the statement man is a wolf. That statement simply directs our attention in a particular way, and it directs our attention entirely in virtue of its literal meaning. So I don't know, maybe that makes the causal theory more plausible than it might initially have seemed, but this still leaves the question, well what on earth is wrong with the idea of metaphorical meaning? It, it's, um, you know, it, it seems kind of intuitive that metaphors do actually have this secondary meaning, so uh, why shouldn't we postulate metaphorical meaning? Well, Davidson has a few different arguments here. His first point is that metaphors are not rule-governed. He says, There are no instructions for devising metaphors. There is no manual for determining what a metaphor means or says. There is no test for metaphor that does not call for taste. The interpretation of a metaphor is a creative process not governed by rules. Compare this to literal language. Literal meaning is compositional. The meaning of a sentence is built up from the meaning of its parts. So if we take the sentence, Frank is greedy, well that's true just in case Frank is a member of the set of greedy people. Then take the longer sentence, Frank is greedy and Vincent is tall. Notice that in this sentence the component Frank is greedy has the same meaning as it did when uttered alone. And in this way we can construct potentially infinite sentences from finite parts and we immediately understand those sentences. This is because we have parts that retain the same meaning in longer constructions, plus, plus strict rules for putting different parts together. Now, clearly, if there was such a thing as metaphorical meaning, it wouldn't work anything like this. Um, it's hard to say in what way metaphorical meaning could work, 
uh, but certainly uh, it doesn't seem to be it doesn't seem to be uh, sort of compositional and based on rules in anything like the, the same way that literal meaning is. The second point: metaphors are resistant to paraphrase. If metaphors worked by communicating some secondary meaning in addition to their literal meaning, then we should be able to say what this secondary meaning is. But we can't. We can't paraphrase a metaphor into different terms because metaphors are totally open-ended and there's no limit to the ideas we might draw from them. This is not just the case for subtle poetic metaphors. Even many everyday metaphors evoke a host of different propositions. Take, you are the cream in my coffee. What proposition does this express? Does it express, I love you, or you are important to me, or I couldn't live without you, or we make a very good match as a couple, or you make me a better person than I would be if I were alone? All of these seem to capture part of the meaning, but they also all miss something, and this list could be extended pretty much indefinitely. I mean, this raises a question for the, for the defender of metaphorical meaning. We all agree that uh, metaphors can be used to prompt various thoughts, images, feelings, inferences. So how exactly do we distinguish all of these ideas that are prompted by the metaphor from the meaning of the metaphor? Uh, I mean, notice that this is easy to do in the case of literal meaning. We can easily specify the literal meaning of a sentence and then distinguish this from the ideas that are prompted by the sentence. But how do we do that for metaphor? Um, from Davidson's point of view, it's no surprise that this question is difficult. Now, the inability to paraphrase metaphor has been one of the primary arguments for the causal view, but it's worth noting that much literal language resists paraphrase as well. Uh, this is discussed by Mark Phelan in his article, The Inadequacy of Paraphrase is the Dogma of Metaphor. Phelan gives the example, French is the language of Quebec. How should we paraphrase this? Does this mean that everyone in Quebec speaks French, or only almost everyone? Does it mean that the French language has some official status in Quebec? I mean, it looks like there are many ways we might paraphrase this sentence, and it's not obvious how to capture the meaning in a single paraphrase. So, does this undermine Davidson's second argument? Well, recall the context here. The traditional view of metaphor is that metaphors have two layers of meanings. There is the proposition literally expressed and the proposition metaphorically expressed. The point of Davidson's second argument is that if there is a proposition metaphorically expressed, shouldn't we be able to say what it is? And that's why we should be able to paraphrase metaphor. With literal language, on the other hand, there's only the proposition literally expressed. The sentence is not being used to express anything else beyond its surface meaning. So there's no reason to ex expect it to be easily paraphrased into some other literal sentence. So you know, whether it's a problem that literal sentences also resist paraphrase is not, not at all obvious. OK, a third argument is that literal sentences serve to direct attention in much the same way as metaphor does, at least as metaphor does according to the causal theory. Consider Ezra Pound's poem In a Station of the Metro. The apparition of these phases in the crowd, petals on a wet black bow. Now, there are two ways we might look at this. Initially, it would appear to be an abbreviated metaphor. So, you know, the apparition of these faces in, in the crowd are petals. Alternatively, we can look at Pound, Pound's poem as simply listing two things, as if in bullet point form. In the latter case, there is no metaphor, it's just a list. Question. Does it make a difference which interpretation we favour? Uh, well, not really. I mean, maybe it makes an aesthetic difference or something, but in terms of the meaning, does it make a difference? Doesn't seem to. The point is the juxtaposition, which is achieved either way. We're simply being invited to make a comparison, and we need nothing more than the literal meanings of the words in order to do so. You know, this the poem directs our attention to it, it, to, it, to faces in a particular way. It makes us think about faces in a particular way. And we need nothing more than the literal meanings in order to do that. Examples like this are common, uh, not only found in poetry. Margot Reimer gives the example, drinking tequila always makes me dizzy. This reminds me I have a lecture on personal identity tonight. Again, this is perfectly literal, but you're being invited to draw a comparison between academic philosophy and drunkenness, to see academic philosophy as drunkenness. Similarly, uh, we can see an analogy between metaphors and jokes. Both metaphors and jokes have points, and some people may get the points while other people may miss the points. But the point of a joke 
or the point of a metaphor is not part of its meaning. You understand the point partly by assigning the correct literal meanings to the terms, but somebody can assign the correct literal meanings and still miss the point. Consider this joke uh, concerning philosophy of mind. Two behaviourists have just had sex. One turns to the other and says, that was great for you, how was it for me? What is the point of this joke? Well, it's a criticism of behaviourism. The speaker th thinks that behaviourism fails to account for the internal feelings or the internal processes going on in the mind. That's the point of the joke, but it's not part of the meaning of the joke as a whole or any part of the joke. Um, I mean, you know, suppose you're asked to rephrase or translate the joke. Uh, so, you know, the, the point of the joke is behaviorism fails to account for internal feelings. Now, if I were to translate the joke, that proposition, the proposition that behaviorism fails to account for internal feelings would not figure anywhere in my, my translation or my paraphrase or, or whatever. Um, so the, the, the point of the joke does not seem to be any part of its actual meaning. And what all of this suggests is that there's simply no need to introduce metaphorical meanings. Uh, recall Occam's razor, do not multiply entities without necessity. Many philosophers take the same principle to hold for a theory of language. If we can account for the work of metaphor simply in terms of its literal meaning, we should prefer that theory to theories that postulate secondary metaphorical meanings. Now, the causal theory has been influential, uh, but naturally the claim that metaphors have no metaphorical meaning at all, only literal meanings, has seemed rather absurd to many people. So unsurprisingly, there are a number of objections. One of the main problems concerns the many ways in which metaphors are used in our speech. We can embed metaphors in larger sentences and draw inferences from them. Uh, Lycan, in his Intro to Philosophy of Language, gives the example uh, of a conditional claim uh, if music is the food of love, play on. Similarly, if Juliet is the sun, she must get a lot of attention from men. Or uh, consider, choose Frank because he's solid as a rock. A particularly problematic kind of embedding is embedding into belief contexts. I believe that Juliet is the sun. I believe that no man is an island. I believe that Frank is solid as a rock. What is it that I'm claiming to believe? I'm surely not claiming to believe the literal meaning of these metaphors. In general, then, we can, we can embed metaphors, we draw inferences from metaphors, and these embeddings and inferences seem to depend on the metaphorical meaning of the metaphor rather, that, rather than on its literal meaning. Second point is that while Davidson may, may be right that it's often difficult to paraphrase metaphor, we can also misinterpret metaphor. Imagine somebody responding to Juliet is the sun by saying, ah, yes, you mean... She depresses people and she smells horrible. On Davidson's view, this interpretation is not incorrect. At most, we can say that the person has missed the point of the metaphor, but they haven't failed to understand what you mean because you know there is nothing you mean beyond the literal. Uh, it's simply that the phrase X is the sun prompts different feelings and different associations in the mind of this person than it does in the rest of us. This person has a different cognitive architecture to the rest of us, uh, but they've you know, understood your meaning perfectly well. Finally, it seems that we can disagree about metaphor. I've just realised um, <laughs> I, I just it just struck me, uh, you know, I prepared these slides and everything earlier, but um, so when I've put second, we can misunderstand metaphors. Imagine somebody responding to Juliet is the sun by saying, ah, you mean she depresses people. Of course, um, they would be incorrect to say you mean she depresses people because there is nothing you mean beyond uh, Juliet is the sun. Um, so, um, yes, in, in that sense, that statement would be incorrect. But when that person thinks of... Juliet as depressing people and smelling hor horrible in response to you saying Juliet is the sun. That is not a uh, misunderstanding, um, at least on, on Davidson's view. They just have different cognitive architecture. Anyway, um, so uh, f f final point here. It seems we can disagree about a metaphor. I say John is a rat, you say no he isn't. What are we disagreeing about? It would appear that something has been asserted and something denied. And that's not the literal meaning of the utterance, which we both know is plainly false. So we have all these phenomena, like drawing inferences from metaphor, embedding metaphor in larger sentences, misinterpreting metaphor, disagreeing about metaphor. How do we account for this if metaphors have no 
cognitive content, if there is no metaphorical meaning beyond the literal meaning. Um, and bear in mind, these are not unusual cases. Given the prevalence of metaphor in our speech, if Davidson is right, then much of what we say is plainly false and fails to convey any sensible meaning. And really, I mean, the general problem here is that it seems like metaphors genuinely do convey information beyond the literal. It seems that speakers can use metaphorical sentences to express beliefs, to express propositions. Um, and, and sometimes, you know, we might even say that the problems with paraphrasing metaphor can be turned against Davidson's theory, because sometimes it seems like no literal language would convey the same kind of information nearly as efficiently as a metaphor does. Kendall Walton gives the example, Crotone is on the arch of the Italian boot. This seems to convey geographical information of a relatively straightforward kind, and there doesn't seem to be any literal translation that would convey the same information in such an, e an efficient and simple manner. We might say something like, Crotone is 120 kilometres southeast of Naples. That's more precise than the metaphor, but it's much less useful for somebody unfamiliar with Italian geography. Almost everybody knows the general shape of Italy. Fewer people know exactly where Naples is. Uh, another problem for Davidson is posed by dead metaphor. As we noted, dead metaphor is a metaphor that's now taken literally and has lost its metaphorical power. The traditional view is that dead metaphor occurs when metaphorical meaning becomes the literal meaning. River's mouth, originally a metaphor which literally attributed part of an organism's anatomy to a river, metaphorically referred to the end of a river. Then as the phrase became popular, it's just used to refer literally to the end of a river. The metaphorical meaning shifts to become the literal meaning. Obviously, Davidson denies that there is any literal meaning, so how can he account for how dead metaphor, dead metaphor acquires a new meaning? Interestingly, Davidson does actually note dead metaphor in his article, though he uses it to defend the causal view. Davidson himself thinks that it's plainly wrong that when a metaphor dies, its metaphorical meaning becomes its literal meaning. When a metaphor like River's Mouth was active, it would have prompted a host of thoughts, feelings, inferences. Uh, perhaps, for example, we would have pictured the river as a whole as a snake or some other similar organism. Uh, to see the end of the river as the river's mouth, one has to see the river as a whole as a kind of organism. So we would see it as having a literal body. And then more abstractly, perhaps we would think of the things that sustain the river, such as rain, as being food for the river. Perhaps we would think of the river as being capable of possessing emotions, as in a calm river or an angry river. None of these associations are preserved in the dead metaphor. Today, river's mouth just means the end of the river, the point where the river makes the sea. You don't need any special devices, any special meaning for expressing that concept. Um, so for Davidson, uh, he, he thinks that, that the traditional account of metaphor is just, is just plainly wrong, right? The metaphorical you know, the sort of things that are prompted by a metaphor when the metaphor is active do not become the literal meaning when the metaphor dies. Um, anyway, that, those were some views of uh, metaphor, some of the traditional uh, views in philosophy of language of, of metaphor. As I say, I'm hoping to talk a bit more about, meta about other views of metaphor in, um, in another video. I'm not sure when I'll get around to that, but that's all for now. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.